tell yourself that the breath is your friend, and you're going to stay with your friend. You're going to be loyal. You're going to be consistent. In other words, you're going to be a true friend to the breath. And that way the breath gets friendlier. But the important thing is that you stay together. There's a Pali term, anupasana, which literally means to follow and to watch. You can translate it as keeping track. And it's a term they use both for concentration and for insight practice. When you're doing mindfulness practice and trying to get the mind to settle down with the breath and stay with the breath to get into concentration, that's called anupasana. You're keeping track of the breath. It's like keeping track of a thread going through a carpet. There are lots of other threads in the carpet, but you're not going to get interested in them. Or if you're going to be interested in them, it's simply how they relate to the thread that you're following. So think of the breath as a thread that you follow through time. And to be on good terms with it, it generally talks about how you work with the breath energy in the body. The Buddha simply says, be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out, and calm bodily fabrication. He also talks about developing a sense of pleasure, a sense of rapture even, and as the mind settles down, and then letting that spread to fill the whole body. And working with the breath is a good way of one being aware of the whole body and letting that sense of ease spread throughout the whole body at the same time, because you're trying to get to a state where the breath fills the body, your awareness fills the body, a sense of ease fills the body. All these things come together. Now, breath here, of course, means breath energy. It's one of the four elements, earth, water, wind, fire. It takes a while sometimes to get on good terms with it, because we sometimes mistake it for the water element. The breath <coughs> flows to the body, but so does the blood. We can confuse the two. You can push the blood around. In fact, we do that an awful lot as we go through our lives. If you've had a lot of repressed emotions, you've been pushing the blood around quite a bit. Or if the body's not well. Sometimes the blood is flowing in the wrong spots and stagnant in other spots. And so when you feel that something's not quite right, then you try to push it around. Well, breath, you can't push. Its nature is all ready to flow. But if you push it, you're pushing the blood. And sometimes that can give you headaches, it can get you you're all discombobulated. So it's important that you understand what it is you're following. You're following the sense of energy. And to let it flow, the word let is important. It's like opening valves on pipes. Or if there's a sense of tension anywhere in the body, you want to relax that tension. It's like opening the valve to allow the breath to flow through. And so there's thinking of releasing. That's pretty much all you have to do. In fact, as the mind begins to settle down, you begin to realize it's the perception you hold in mind that's going to make all the difference. That's going to allow you to relax to begin with, keep you relaxed, and allow the breath to flow smoothly throughout the body. And the flow seems to be at working at cross purposes. In other words, it's flowing in one direction in one part and in an opposite direction in another part. And they're clashing. Just hold in mind the idea, okay, how could they work together? And sometimes the breath will just sort itself out. All you have to do is allow. And then as a sense of well-being spreads, you can let your awareness spread into the body. As concentration works, mindfulness works, this process of anupasana, keeping track, works best if everything is on good terms. And you're trying to get the mind anchored in the body with the breath. And you follow this, regardless of whatever else comes up. Sometimes visions come, sometimes sounds come. 
And all too often we think, ah, oh, here's a sign that something important is happening. Well, you try to stay with the breath because the breath is meaningless. And don't go jumping for meanings. We had a visitor here recently who was trying to gauge what level of concentration he was on and where he advanced it in terms of insight. And these things don't come with signs. Whatever signs there are could easily be coming from ignorance. Your main task is to anupasana, to follow and watch this one thing and be in good terms with it. And you're with something that's meaningless because it then allows you to question the meanings that you give to things. When a sign comes up or a vision comes up and the mind says X, this must be this or this must be that, well, put a question mark next to that comment. Because one of the easiest ways that meditation can pull you astray is if you start giving meanings to things and believing the meanings. Either when a vision comes or when an insight comes, you say, oh, this must be a sign of X or I've reached this level or that level. That's how people go astray. Obagasa has a good comment. She says, whenever an insight comes, look at what follows the insight immediately in the mind. Sometimes you see there's a little bit of greed, a, bit, a little bit of aversion. And then you realize, okay, that the insight has been tainted. You've latched onto it. And John Lee's method for dealing with insights as they come like this is to ask yourself, to what extent is it true and to what extent is it false? And to what extent is the opposite true? So you can put a question mark next to these things. But the important thing is you begin to see these processes of the mind as you give meanings to things, and then ride with them. And you can see that you can cause yourself an awful lot of trouble that way. And this is where the anapasana turns from concentration into insight. The difference between concentration and insight is basically the questions you're asking. With concentration, the main question is, how do I get the mind to settle down? How do I get to enjoy the object? How do I get to be continually with the object, become one with the object, and you follow it? With insight, the questions are, how is this a fabrication, and what's the best way to deal with these fabrications? And the Buddhist instructions on breath. It's divided into four tetrads, and each tetrad, the, the process is the same. One, one tetrad deals with the breath, one tetrad with feelings, another with mind, another with, with dhammas. In other words, the four frames of reference and the establishing of mindfulness. In each case, you get sensitive to the fact that that particular thing is being fabricated. And then you play with it. I hate in that sense, oh yes, this really is something that I'm putting together right now. Because your experiences are composed of two things. One is the results of karma coming in from the past, and the other is what you're doing right now, both what you're doing right now and the results of what you're doing right now. In fact, what you're doing right now is what enables you to experience the stuff coming in from the past to begin with. When the Buddha explains dependent core rising, this fabrication in the present moment actually comes prior to your awareness of the results of past actions. And the Buddha wants you to see that. You don't have much control over the results of past actions, but you do have control of what you're doing right now. And you want to see, what am I doing right now that's causing suffering? Can I fabricate things in a way that cause less suffering? So with the breath, you see that it is a kind of fabrication. The way you breathe sometimes goes totally on automatic pilot, but there is an intentional element. And all too often that automatic pilot disguises some underlying intentions that you don't notice. So you try to bring that up into consciousness. Okay, I am deciding when to breathe in, when to breathe out. And how can I do that well? How can I find a sense of ease and well-being?
And then how can I calm the effect of the breath on the mind? The same goes with feelings. Feelings are part of what they call metal fabrication. They go together with perceptions. Perceptions are the images you hold in mind. And here we're interested in the perceptions that you use to keep the mind with a breath. But also the perceptions that you use to deal with any obstructions that come up, any hindrances that come up. The number one thing is to perceive, say, sensual desire, ill will. Perceive them as hindrances. Perceive anything that pulls you away from the breath right now is a hindrance. And then learn to perceive it as something that you really want to get through. Those are two different perceptions. Sometimes you can perceive something as a hindrance, but another part of the mind says, I don't care, I like it. So you have to have other perceptions to help you see, well, this really is not anywhere you want to go. You can think about the drawbacks of that hindrance. If you thought about it for 24 hours, where would it take you? Well, not anywhere good. So why give it any time at all? But more important are the perceptions that allow you to stay with the breath. And you'll find that different perceptions will have a different effect on the breath and a different effect on the mind. So use the perceptions first that give rise to a sense of well-being, pleasure, rapture. And then use the perceptions that calm it down, that give rise more to a state of equanimity. So you can see to what extent you really are fabricating things right now. And those are the fabrications you want to get insight into. Which are the ones you want to hold on to, which ones are the ones you don't want to hold on to, i.e., which are the ones you want to keep doing, and which ones are habits that you want to stop. This is where we bring in some more perceptions, the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. And that, too, is a kind of anupasana, as you apply a perception, say, to the breath or to the mind as being something inconstant being something fabricated. Again, you're keeping track of something, you're keeping track of its inconstancy or its stress or the fact that you have no control over it. You may have some control over it, but if you didn't have any control over these things, you wouldn't be able to meditate, you wouldn't be able to practice. But there's an extent to which you try to control things and you run up against a wall. You want to see that. And ask yourself, to what extent can I find true happiness with this? To what extent can I hold on to this and depend on this? And when you see that it's not worth depending on, that's when you let it go. As long as it is worth depending on as you're working on your practice, you don't let it go quite yet. But when the path is fully developed, that's when you let go of everything. You see that everything is not worth holding on to. It's a value judgment. And there's no technique that can convince you of the value of letting go until you see for yourself that you go for a particular way of fabricating things in your mind, fabricating your experience, because there's an allure. And you have to ask yourself, what is it that I'm trying to get out of this, especially when it's something like greed, aversion, or delusion? And then you compare the allure with the drawbacks. And as long as you don't quite see what the real allure is, why you're really going for it, no matter how much you tell yourself to let go, it's like trying to shake tar off of your hand. It's going to hold on. So you have to be very still. This is why concentration and discernment have to go together. Be very still to watch. When the mind goes for something, why does it go? What does it think is getting out of it? And the reasons are going to differ from person to person. This is why the Buddha didn't teach a technique for vipassana. He told you these are the questions you ask. To what extent is this fabrication? To what extent can I trust it? 
to what extent do I realize that it's an activity I don't want to engage in anymore? Those are the questions you ask as you anupasana, as you follow the thread of inconstancy, or as you follow the thread of stress or, or not-self. And then the mind learns how to be perfectly fine with letting go. And again, if you don't have the concentration, you try to let go of things, your, the mind feels lost. It's thrashing around. Which is one of the reasons why the Buddha said you keep track of the breath as you're keeping track of these other things at the same time. You don't leave the breath. It's just the questions you ask get more sophisticated, more subtle. And John Lee's images of cutting down a forest. That's concentration. Then inside is what burning all the logs. It's the same forest. But just what you do with it gets more subtle and gets more effective, gets more thorough in getting rid of stress in the mind. Because even just concentration can get rid of a lot of stress. But insight gets rid of more. And it's all centered around this process of anupasana, keeping track, keeping following the thread of the breath, following the thread of the mind's fabrications. Seeing when they're worth holding on to and seeing when they're not. That's why it's all one practice. Simply the questions develop. And the results will develop too. So stick with your friend. The breath is the friend that enables all of this to happen. And try to get on good terms with it. As for the things that distract you or things that come up, aside from that, remember you're sticking with this one thread. And you don't want the other threads to distract you and pull you away.